I will make room for you. <laughs> okay, we're good. Okay. Um, who's, who's our first speaker? So I yes, I'm I'm I'll, I'll kick it off and then we can uh, each introduce ourselves and then um, uh, give an overview. So uh, so so my name is Ben Holter. I'm a research scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, uh, where I sit in the Earth Science Division in the Biospheric Sciences Lab. And um, and so, so yeah, we'll be discussing today. Um, a uh, couple of dimensions of uh, the global methane budget and global methane cycle. Uh, one component of this is that in 2020, uh, we observed a record uh, growth of um, atmospheric methane in the atmosphere, uh, which has been sustained in 2021. And this morning, uh, uh, I was on a team who published a, a paper in Nature uh, that's attributed the uh, the 2020 growth uh, of methane uh, to, to, to various uh, uh, processes in the atmosphere and on the land, uh, which I'll, I'll mention. Um, and, uh, and then we'll also uh, discuss uh, the, the growth of methane in the atmosphere is sort of in the context of how NASA observes atmospheric methane concentrations. Uh, we're, we're in this incredibly exciting and new era of space-based uh, greenhouse gas retrievals. Uh, and so, so Dan will uh, discuss some of the work that his team are involved with there. Um, and then in the context of climate mitigation, uh, wetland systems um, in particular have been pointed out as a uh, uh, climate mitigation solution uh, through the, the nomenclature of uh, blue carbon. Uh, and, and so Lola's team um, have documented the losses of um, uh, global wetlands, uh, focusing on salt marshes. Uh, and so this is useful information to serve as a baseline for where blue carbon uh, activities can take place. Uh, and then and then David Lagomasino at Eastern Carolina University uh, will discuss some of the work uh, that's uh, being done in the context of blue carbon with uh, various stakeholders. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so so Lola, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi everyone. My name is Lola Patayindo, and I'm a research scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And I'm in the biospheric sciences lab where I work on remote sensing and mapping of forests and coastal wetlands. And I'm uh, David Lagomasino. I'm an assistant professor at East Carolina University, but I was also at, at NASA Goddard beforehand. Uh, I focus a lot on remote sensing of coastal, so actually the coastal processes. What's the reason why we're actually kind of um, changing our coastlines around the world? Uh, but with a particular influence on connecting that remote sensing data with stakeholders to improve decision making on uh, whether that's carbon or whether that's other ecosystem services that are happening along the coast. I'm Dan Pestworth, a uh, project scientist at Carbon Mapper and a research scientist at the University of Arizona. I was formerly at NASA JPL. And when I talk, talk, talk a little more of the anthropogenic side, and a lot of the work we've done is on um, so called super emitters but really exceptionally disproportionately uh, sized uh, methane emissions and how to detect them and provide the data so that it's useful for mitigation. Okay, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so this figure is showing the, uh, the increase of, uh, of atmospheric methane in the atmosphere uh, that's based off of a network of uh, flask measurements that you can see on, on the map in the top left. Uh, so this is coming from the uh, the NOAA greenhouse, Global Greenhouse Gas uh, Reference Network, and so we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Lindsay Lang sitting here, uh, who maintains uh, the Global Greenhouse Gas Reference Network, uh, and can explain uh, more detail on sort of how this is assembled, uh, including how the, uh, the the eruption of Mauna Loa is affecting uh, the, uh, the 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 measurements currently. Um, for methane compared to CO2, which typically shows sort of a straight up increase, uh, you can see that methane since 1982 or so increased uh, in the atmosphere. Then the concentrations plateaued between 2000 and 2007. Uh, and then there was an abrupt increase in 2007, uh, followed by sort of another inflection in 2012. Uh, and then in 2020, uh, you can see that there's been another inflection uh, toward increased uh, growth rates. Um, and so this is important to track because methane is the, the second most important greenhouse gas after CO2, uh, contributing between 15 to 30 percent of uh, the, the 1.1 degree warming that we've had to date. Um, 
Methane is also a, a precursor for tropospheric ozone, uh, which has health implications for, for people and for agriculture. Um, and then uh, in, in the context of climate mitigation, uh, methane is uh, offers sort of the, the most potential uh, for mitigating climate change in the short term. Uh, initiatives like the, the Global Methane Pledge that was announced at COP26 aim to reduce anthropogenic methane emissions by 30% uh, by 2030. Uh, and so, uh, so it's obviously a very active sort of area of, of research uh, for, this, for this trace gas uh, from an earth system perspective and climate and climate mitigation perspective. Uh, so next click. So, uh, so here's just to sort of highlight um, the, some of the following slides that focus on the, uh, the 2020 growth. Uh, between 2007 to 2019, the growth rate was, was sort of hovering around nine parts per billion per year. And then in 2020, it jumped to uh, 15.1 parts per billion. And 2020, uh, 2021, it's about 16 parts per billion. Uh, and then we, we won't know until the data come in from, from NOAA in, in around January, February time, uh, what happened in 2022. So next slide. Um, so global methane budget, uh, the, the, the sources of emissions for methane uh, come primarily from anthropogenic activities related to uh, oil, coal, and, and gas exploration. So this is about 20-30% um, uh, of emissions. Uh, then there's about an additional 40% of emissions coming from agriculture. Uh, so the, this is sort of the, the, the famed uh, cow burps uh, is, is a large part of that, but also rice, rice agriculture um, and, and waste management. Uh, so about 60% of the total budget is, is of the total emissions are anthropogenic. Uh, and then the remainder is, is wetlands uh, and, and other minor sources like termites and, and fires, uh, and geologic seepage and so on. Then when the methane gets in the atmosphere, um, it's removed through chemical reactions uh, with um, uh, this, this hydroxyl um, uh, compound, uh, which, is, which is also sort of referred to as the detergent of the atmosphere because it scrubs a lot of the uh, reactive gases um, and, and converts them to other um, uh, uh, forms. And so hydroxyls or OH uh, remove about 85% of um, the, the methane that's emitted to the atmosphere. Uh, each year. And so um, the imbalance between the emissions and the removals leads to the, the growth rate. And uh, this figure is taken from the Global Carbon Project, and we're currently updating uh, this budget to extend it through 2020, and that should be published next year. So next slide. Um, so as, as I mentioned, and, and Dan will cover this in detail, we're in this incredible era of new space-based observations of greenhouse gases, uh, both for CO2 and, and for methane. Uh, in particular, um, this is sort of built up through uh, work that's happening on the commercial side, but also at the, uh, the public space agencies. And there's sort of two families of um, greenhouse gas satellites currently, ones that are designed to detect the, the point source emissions from uh, oil, oil, gas, agriculture activities, and then these uh, sort of area-based um, images that are uh, focused on trying to build up uh, sort of the background information of the greenhouse gas concentrations. So next slide. Uh, and then, yeah, I think if you press play. So um, oh, if you go back, is, Let's try that again. does that work? So, so this is a new uh, visualization that, that the NASA uh, Science Visualization Studio has developed. And um, it shows, it shows sort of, it, it illustrates sort of the, the complexity that we have in understanding uh, the emissions of, of, of global wetlands. Um, and um, about 60% of, of uh, wetland methane emissions come from the tropics, um, about 20% come from the high latitudes. Uh, in the tropics, uh, we're concerned about how warming, how changes in precipitation regimes uh, will, will alter how much methane is produced. Uh, and then in the high latitudes, we're, we're obviously interested in permafrost thaw, uh, thermocarst formation, and uh, climate carbon feedbacks that could be happening. Um, uh, and with, especially with, with the degree of warming that, that's happening in the high latitudes, uh, which is as high as four times uh, the, the global um, average rate of warming. So next slide. Okay, so um, so so this is I think I just have two more and then pass over to uh, to, to Lola. Um, the, the the paper that was published this morning uh, focuses again on on 2020, uh, and uh, we go through uh, various uh, inventory data, 
um, uh, in situ measurement networks like like the ones that, that Lindsay runs, uh, and then atmospheric observations uh, from uh, the GOSAT greenhouse gas satellite. And um, what we find is that uh, similar to CO2, uh, there was a decrease in, in methane emissions coming from uh, fossil fuel activities. Uh, for CO2, there was about a 5% uh, decrease in, in CO2 emissions. And, um, and we find about the, the, the similar order of magnitude uh, decrease uh, for, for methane emissions. Uh, there was also a decrease in methane emissions from, uh, from fire, even though 2020 was, um, had some spectacularly large uh, and, and intense fires. Uh, globally, uh, there was a, a small decline in the amount of area that was burned, uh, and, and, meth and, and methane is a byproduct of, of fire emissions, and so there was a reduction in uh, methane from fire. Um, 2020 was marked by these uh, climate extremes. Uh, the, uh, the high latitudes were uh, over half a degree warmer uh, than, than the year before. Uh, the tropics were 10 to 30 percent wetter uh, than the previous year. And so we find that um, about half of the increase in 2020 can be attributed to uh, changes in wetlands uh, globally. Um, and so then that leaves us with another half of the growth rate to be explained. And uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the COVID-19 lockdowns led to um, uh, a, a decrease in, in, in energy and transportation. And, um, and then uh, and, and, and those processes, those activities uh, lead to, to different air pollutants, uh, nitrous oxides, and uh, the NOx gases are sort of the beginning of a chain reaction that um, produces uh, this, this hydroxyl compound in the atmosphere. So with less NOx, uh, you end up with less OH and the lifetime of methane increases, leading to increases in the concentrations of methane. Um, so about 53% of the growth is, is due to this atmospheric chemistry and 47% of the growth is due to wetlands. And um, the implications for this is that we need to sort of take into account uh, the fact that we may be seeing the beginning of uh, carbon climate feedbacks uh, kick in uh, from, from wetlands. Um, and so this, this sort of reinforces the need for, for more comprehensive monitoring of these systems. And then the other implication is um, in the context of things like the Global Methane Pledge uh, and, and sort of the interactions between improvements in air quality uh, and how that might change the atmospheric chemistry, requiring more stringent uh, reductions to be made for um, uh, methane emissions. So with that, oh, and so yeah, one more slide and then Lola. So just to sort of set up um, some of the following work. Um, so yeah, so at NASA, we have, we have lots of field campaigns uh, trying to understand uh, where methane is being produced in wetland systems as, as part of these monitoring efforts. And so, um, yeah, next slide, I think is Lola. Yeah, Liza, so there's somebody trying to come in. You've yes, I'm just trying to get into it. Right, so I'm Lola Fatoyenbo, and I'm Ben's colleague at NASA Goddard, and I'll be talking to you about um, blue carbon ecosystems. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so what we've been working on is improving the mapping and monitoring of blue carbon ecosystems. And when we talk about blue carbon, we talk about mangroves, um, salt marshes, and seagrasses. So on the slide on the left, you have a mangrove forest. In the middle, I have a picture of a salt of a, of a seagrass meadow and on the right of a salt marsh. And the reason that we are interested in mapping these ecosystems is because we know that they are harbors for biodiversity, have many ecosystem services, but they also store really large amounts of carbon, especially in their soil. And as it turns out, they actually, as opposed to freshwater wetlands, um, are thought to emit less methane than other freshwater uh, wetlands because of the chemical reaction that happens with seawater. So if you go to the next slide, um, just to give you a little bit of background more on blue carbon ecosystems. Um, these are systems that are um, coastal marine systems. So they sit at the interface of land and sea. Um, some of them are submerged um, all of the time or most of the time like um, seagrass meadows, whereas others are tidally influenced like the salt marshes and mangroves. And so if you go to the next slide, um, what we've really been focusing on is establishing the baselines and trying to better understand where these ecosystems are. So mangrove forests are found primarily in tropical and subtropical regions. Um, they've been got, getting a lot of press lately 
people are really interested in mangrove forests because they do store a lot of carbon and they provide a lot of services, especially to um, when it comes to um, climate change uh, mitigation, like protecting coastlines and um, protecting from coastlines from er erosion or from hurricane impacts or from sea level rise. And so we've actually done a really good job at mapping where mangroves are globally and also regionally. Um, but tidal marshes, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows are not mapped nearly as well. Um, tidal marshes actually fill the same like ecological space that mangroves do, um, but in the um, temperate zones. So they don't grow to uh, large trees, but they have exactly the same ecosystem services. They provide nursery services, they protect the shorelines. And so just last week, we, we re um, released a new paper, you can go to the next slide, um, where we were able to map all of the um, global salt marsh change and estimate where the hotspots are of global salt marsh change and what the related carbon emissions are from these net losses that we're seeing. So um, on the right here, I have two uh, images that are showing an area in China where you see um, on the top image, this is a Landsat image from 2000. Um, and then on the, bot on, the right, on the bottom right image, you see a Landsat image from 2019. And essentially we're seeing many regions where you have um, areas of salt marsh um, expansion. Um, but on a global scale, we actually have a net loss of salt marsh. And so if you go to the next slide, um, here's some of our main results. Um, and sorry for the differences in colors here. Um, so we, we found that globally net salt marsh loss was about 1400 kilometers squared between 2000 and 2019. This is roughly equivalent to two football fields every hour that are lost globally. Um, and so as opposed to many of the uh, to mangrove systems, actually most of the salt marshes worldwide are found in North America. Um, so the U.S. Um, and Canada have really large expanses of, of salt marshes, and the U.S. is also the region where we're seeing the most losses of salt marshes. And so we are also, we're looking at what the main drivers are of losses in these ecosystems. And because they're actually protected, most of the salt marshes are protected in the U.S. There's a law that, uh, that protects them. All of the changes that we're seeing are actually due to climate primarily. And so we found that when you look at what the main drivers are of the losses of these salt marshes, that storm events are really the main driver of loss. And especially in North America, when you look at um, watersheds that had hurricanes impact them, we found that hurricanes are like the main driver of this loss. And because we're having more intense hurricanes and more intense hurricane seasons, these salt marshes are also not able to recover the way that they might be doing it naturally. So this really highlights the climate dependence that we have between these systems and expected increases and changes in precipitation and changes of extreme events um, in salt marshes. And so, right. Um, if you're more interested in this, I have here we have a uh, a um, uh, an app where you can go and you can actually um, look at the at the maps um, on the web. So I have this picture here. You can look at the at the QR code, and I believe. That is the last slide for me. Oh, I have one more. Oh, yeah. So um, one question that we're really interested in, and that's really um, something of importance, especially looking at changes in um, that uh, changes in climate, is that these coastal wetlands are responding to change, but they're responding to change differently. And so this has really big implications depending on where you are, what's happening whether you're looking at salt marshes or mangroves, these are two systems that are really um, interrelated and that have different um, responses depending on where you are. And this has big implications for the carbon cycling that you have. So in some areas, you might have an expansion of mangrove forests, which could potentially lead to larger carbon sinks. But this also has implications for biodiversity, and for other ecosystem services that are normally provided by salt marshes that are in that region. And so this is something that we're still working at um, and, and looking at, especially with the Blue Flux campaign also that Ben mentioned earlier, we're really interested in looking at those interfaces where you have salt marshes, you have mangroves, you have freshwater wetlands. What are the implications for changes that are happening for the carbon cycling of those systems? Okay. 
I'm next. All right. Uh, so switching gears a little bit to the anthropogenic side of the methane cycle, uh, methane cycle, methane budget. Um, I want to show some examples of images that we've got using imaging spectroscopy, a type of remote sensing that's a little bit atraditional um, from classical remote sensing approaches, but it goes to what Ben was saying about a category of instruments that are really high resolution. They detect plumes or super emitters, you know, super localized um, detections. Not every instrument can do this. These types of instruments, they can't, they can't map a whole flux from a wetland, but they can see super emitters. This is very important when we think of anthropogenic um, sources of large methane emissions. Knowing exactly where it's coming from is how you're going to mitigate it. So on the left here, I'm showing two aerial images, just Google Earth screenshots. The one on the top is a landfill. The one on the bottom is a livestock operation, cattle farm. On the, we flew these with these NASA-built imaging spectrometers um, on aircraft. And on the right are the plumes that we detected. So these are the concentrations of methane that we saw coming. So you see these, you know, the, the purple and the yellow, these are really high cost. So you can't see it with the eye, methane's invisible, but you can see the plumes coming off of the face of the landfill or coming off of a manure lagoon um, at the cattle ranch. And these are on the side, you know, order of you know, three to five tons of methane an hour that are coming um, off of these. So pretty large emissions. Can you go to the next slide? As we've been doing this all over the United States, um, really since 2016, but this is just 2022, the flights that um, Carbon Mapper has done in conjunction with NASA JPL and um, Arizona State University. We have flown across multiple anthropogenic sectors, so livestock, waste, oil and gas, um, energy industries, coal, et cetera, a lot of different methane sources in the United States. Each of these dots, the color represents the sector, the size of the dot represents the emission rate that we got for each of these plumes. I mean, some of these are pretty massive, you know, 12,000 kilograms an hour. These usually refer to coal mine vents in um, areas like Pennsylvania, where it's a totally permitted process, but you are just venting from underground coal mines, um, absolutely massive amounts of methane. We also went into Canada this year, so um, over a thousand plumes that we detected in 2022 alone um, with uh, imaging spectrum, airborne imaging spectrometry. So you see a map like this and you say, okay, well, that's, yeah, I don't know. I look at this map, I say, okay, that's interesting. Um, but, you know, the question is, so what? <laughs> is, this, is this a drop in the bucket or, you know, what's the what's the actual amount of methane that we emitted in the United States this year? Are these, are these important? Uh, can you go to the next slide? Oh. Next, next slide, yeah. Little taste of that. So uh, Ben, he mentioned these other types of satellites, these area flux mappers that are more precise, and they can't they can't localize a methane source, but they can constrain a number for a basin or for a region, for example. So that's what these blue bars in this chart represent. So we flew over a bunch of different basins since twenty uh, well twenty sixteen, but here I'm just showing twenty nineteen to twenty twenty one, and we took this tropomi satellite, and we took one of these area flux mapping satellites and constrained a total methane emission. So it wasn't spatially disaggregated, but what is a total flux coming out of the Permian Basin or coming out of the San Joaquin Valley? And that's what these blue bars are. And then we said, okay, well, we were flying our aircraft that was getting just the super emitter at the same time. So if I were to just add up all of the plumes that I saw with my aircraft, how much was it? And that's what these dark red bars are. So what we found is that the super emitters are making up 20 to 60 percent of all of the methane emissions in the base in the basin on average. Put that in context, a place like the Permian Basin in Texas has 200,000 oil and gas wells, if, if not more, in addition to compressor stations, in addition to miles of pipeline. We saw super emitters at less than 1 percent of all of that infrastructure. But that less than 1 percent amount of infrastructure made up 50% of all of the emissions in the basin. So if you think about where do you go mitigate something, it seems pretty clear to me. Um, next slide. Um, and so the aircraft are great. We've been doing a lot with the aircraft, but you can't get into every country. 
Um, and it's expensive to fly planes and you don't get the revisit. A lot of this is, you know, you want to, you want to, if you see something, you want to go back, you want to go back, you want to go back, right? If it's been reported mitigated, you want to go back. It's hard to do that with aircraft campaigns because of the costs and logistics. So really the, the solution is how do we get these point source imagers into space in such a way that we are getting this global coverage? So NASA launched um, EMINT satellite really to, to, map dry arid regions for minerals but the sensor can also do methane pretty dang well it's on the iss this was launched last year it only looks at dry arid regions um, globally but there's a lot of oil and gas in dry arid regions um, so these are plumes that were detected by the yeah. instrument in turkmenistan um, uh, last year and so it is on the International Space Station. It has a lifetime of about a, you know, a year, and it's, it's uh, out there mapping plumes. This EMIT instrument is also the precursor for what I'm working on right now, which is the carbon mapper constellation of satellites. So it's kind of the next generation of um, this type of instrument, uh, planning to launch the first two satellites in you know, the fourth quarter of 2023. Um, but instead of just looking at dry arid regions, looking at you know the global picture trying to map the large methane emissions and um, globally uh, next slide um, but while, while that's all happening and the satellites are exciting we're still flying the aircraft and um trying to get as much as possible out of the united states to feel like we've flown the united states let's go elsewhere so um you know we, we've just announced hard mappers announced we have a, a big baseline waste project global waste project that we're starting which is to create a, a baseline of methane waste emissions globally. I mean, you'd think, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty still in the waste sector, you know, in many sectors, but in the waste sector, there's a lot because uh, waste is an extremely complex, you know, thing. So in a landfill, even in a managed landfill in the, in the United States, it's hard to quantify the emissions. If you start thinking globally where there's a lot of informal dumping sites, I mean, the problem, First, you go, where are they? We don't even know where they are. Next, where are all the emissions? So we have a lot of funding to do this with aircraft and the satellites. And we're gonna start in early of 2023 flying, uh, plan um, to fly in uh, countries in South America to look for waste, but also other potential methane emission sectors they have, mostly oil and gas. So those are my slides. Thanks. Rick Davids. Yeah. Oh, you have them. Yeah. You want me to show them on my computer? I've got them. It's on for me. Okay. Perfect. So, you know, as we're thinking about, you know, these different aspects of the carbon cycle, of the methane budget, um, there are people in communities that are next to and around these different um, ecosystems. You know, they're being impacted by those changes, the stuff that Lola mentioned in terms of sea level rise, changes in precipitation, storm events, land cover change. I just show this, this is our coastal campus out in the Outer Banks where we're at one of the highest sort of eroding shorelines in the region. Um, so we're actually even one of those stakeholders as well. Right? So we are in somewhat protected by this marsh, but it's eroding at about 10 meters or so per year. So we're thinking about, well, how do we actually protect that, that salt marsh in this case, um, but also looking at some of those other measurements that, that Ben uh, mentioned and actually making those in situ, right, in, in our marsh there on campus. Next slide, please. You know, and, and what Lola mentioned earlier is when we look at some of these blue carbon systems, uh, particularly mangroves and, and salt marshes, this is the majority of the reason of that loss, right? The, the conversion of these habitats to some other land cover. Most cases, 60% of that 
um, or the majority worldwide is, is related to commodities, right? And so what, what Ben mentioned in terms of that agriculture product, this is where it's, it, some of it is actually kind of coming from, this conversion of these blue oak carbon systems. So here you're looking at a, an area that's been slashed and burned. Um, this was a mangrove forest. This now has become a rice paddy. And so again, this is the majority of what, what's happening around uh, um, the world. Next slide. And so when we think about, well, what's this, all this science information that, that Dan mentioned in terms of those super emitters, the, the data that's coming from, um, from methane and all of these different sort of remote sensing maps that we're getting is, well, we need to make sure we're connecting that to those stakeholders. And so we are working with, here you're seeing a picture of, of some uh, policy and managers in the Philippines. And they're really interested in, in integrating this information into their own decision-making process. Because we know that it's, it's not just carbon or not just methane that we're worried about. We're also balancing those other ecosystem services that Lola was mentioning, right? Um, if you're thinking about those nurseries, right? The fish that we're getting, the shrimp, if you like shrimp, if you like clams, right? They're coming from a lot of these different ecosystems, right? So if we want to make sure that that's sustainable. It's a balance between um, those ecosystem services and then, you know, like the climate side of things, the carbon and methane. So we're actively working with folks in the Philippines as part of a, a larger USAID project. Um, where they're trying to understand marine protected areas, where to, to put new protected areas, um, but also what to consider with that, right? So a major part of that is, is fisheries and sustainable fisheries, but they're also thinking about the carbon uh, and methane parts. So making sure that we share this information, this is a missing part of their decision-making process. And so we're making sure that this stuff is integrated with what they're doing. Next slide. And so that's the managers, but then there's the actual community members that are there that are living within those coastal communities that are rely almost entirely, um, their livelihoods rely almost entirely on those wetlands themselves. So these are, again, sort of community members within the Philippines that rely heavily on clams, on shrimp, on fish that are at these, at this interface at the, at the coast. And so we also have to think about them, right? In terms of if we also think about, you know, um, climate migrations and all those things, climate refugees that might be happening, right? These are folks that are, are at the forefront of these different changes. And so we also have to make sure that those community members um, are involved. And so we're working with them, making sure that we're learning from them because they're seeing this firsthand. Um, and so knowing where those areas of changes are, uh, but then bringing our scientific information to say, well, these are the other things that we need to be considering um, beyond just, you know, um, some of the, their day-to-day -day needs. We're also thinking about the larger sort of climate role in this. Next slide. And when I, we talk about these ecosystem services, I really like showing this this image here because this encompasses all of that. So you see the food here on, on the side. Um, this is that shrimp, it's the clams, it's the rice that's also been converted from those mangroves ecosystems that they're growing, right? So they rely heavily on this. They're building their shelters from the center, from the wood that's here. Their fuel is coming from those, those mangroves and those peat soils um, and, but you also see the infrastructure parts, right? The way that the humans are changing that landscape, changing the way the, the water moves, which in essence then has an impact on the methane and carbon cycles of that. Um, so it's sort of a, a, a nice photo that kind of encompasses all of those different ecosystem services. And one in particular, next slide, one to also think about is the protective ecosystem services. So this is again in the Philippines. Um, this is after Typhoon Odette that just passed by, I guess, a year ago in December um, of 2021. Um, and these are those communities, right? And they are protected from that storm surge, that energy that's coming from those waves and that wind because of these different ecosystems. Um, and so this, again, is a balance 
of, well, understanding, yes, the carbon cycle, the methane budget that's coming from this, but balancing with, with those other ecosystem services and the communities that are actually um, living within those areas. Next slide. And, you know, one of the things that, that Lola mentioned earlier, right, the role of cyclones uh, and extreme events and storm events, this is what we're seeing in Florida right now. Um, so this is at the time of the picture is four and a half years, but you know, five years after the storm, this is what we see out in a very large portion um, of the Everglades right now. So we're, we're seeing this conversion done naturally because of extreme events. So combine that 60% of human influence and now increasing frequency of storms, of, of droughts, the overlapping of storms and droughts, right? They're all going to be um, impacting that methane budget that Ben talked about, where those emissions are coming from uh, that Dan was talking about, um, but then where we're seeing those losses and gains and, and remote sensing and this data that we're pulling together helps us identify where these things are actually happening and how fast they're happening around the world. We've got about five minutes to chat. <laughs> <laughs> so they can jump in whenever they like. Okay, so wetlands, good or bad? I know, we're going to blame it all on the wetlands are worse than the fossil fuel industry is my takeaway from that. <laughs> wetlands, good or bad? Um, well, I mean, some, me... some of these uplifts, these upticks, yeah. have been attributed to um, you know, massive pulses from South Sudan wetlands uh, and the like, right? So um, in some senses, that, that's anthropogenic as well, because that's controlled by water flows from further upstream, which is, you know, a, a country national thing where they're competing for water, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, well, I, I mean, the wetlands are just doing what wetlands do. <laughs> so... Um, so that I, I suppose they're neither good or bad, but I, I think the concern now is that we might be seeing the beginning of wetland methane emissions responding to climate change. And I, I think that the growth in methane that we saw from 2007 to you know, the mid 2010s, uh, it was it was there was more evidence for for some anthropogenic activities, agriculture, fossil fuel exploration contributing to that. Uh, but but now it, it, it but the the last three years it seems like uh, something different is driving this, and mm -hmm. it looks like wetlands um, are, are the culprit. But there 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 is still, like I said, um, sixty percent of what, emissions what, from human activities. If that's the case, what has happened? I mean, on the ground, was, yeah, to 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 get that. Uh, well, I, I think when now uh, permafrost thaw is is you know lots yeah. of evidence for this paper, paper just uh, four weeks ago uh, with with actual direct measurements of fluxes mm -hmm. uh, for the last twenty years in Siberia uh, showed that there is now a trend uh, from those measurements. Uh, I think some of NOAA's high latitude network is now showing at the individual locations evidence that uh, methane is increasing in those uh, permafrost areas, and then in the tropics. It, it, we, we think it might be sort of the changes in the precipitation frequency that is um, uh, leading to sort of bigger pulses of methane coming out. I mean, things like the suit is complicated because it, it's not necessary. I mean, the suit was under-recognized as a large source of methane. And so, so we don't really know whether methane is increasing in places like the, the suit wetlands, but now it's an area that we'll pay more attention to. Mm -hmm. What was the, um, there was a bright light right in the middle of Africa. It didn't seem to darken at all. What was that? It could be the Quebec Central. Right. Uh, the Congo, yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, what, the where is Congo it? Peatland? The Congo Peatlands. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It looked around the Congo. So, yeah. I was also so. going to add to what Ben was saying that there's also the question when you're saying wetlands good or bad, it's not just the question of wetlands, but also healthy wetlands yeah. or natural wetlands or are they stressed? You know, are they degraded? Is there, are there other dynamics that are happening? Which I think will also come out as something that's really important. Because what we're seeing, for example, in Florida is if you have an if you have an impounded area or you have a wetland where you don't have the natural flow of water that's happening, that's where you might have changes in the carbon cycling 
that could result in changes in their carbon emissions. So in areas where you may have had it sink before, because it was primarily a mangrove forest, you know, if that is being converted to something else, that's where you may have increases in um, methane emissions. Mm -hmm. or, and a decrease also of the carbon yeah. uptake, right? Because you no longer have that natural sink of vegetation that's taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm, it's a complicated story, yes. isn't it? Yeah. And um, Dan, I was just I was just wondering the the, the rush of um, missions that's coming. Is there any coordination? I mean, do they will they look at different things? Are they doing their own thing? What, what are they doing? Yeah, about? it's uh, there is coordination. There should be more. Um, you know, every satellite mission is going to have its piece of its puzzle that it's optimized to look at. You know, so certain type of uh, emitter, maybe certain type of sector, area coverage, point source coverage. Some are optimized for spatial completeness. Some are optimized for temporal completeness. So like, look at the same site, just keep looking at it versus look at the whole globe, right? Mm -hmm. So th there's coordination efforts. There should be more. There, these these got to come together. It's complicated by, you know, various different entities, commercial, yeah. public, private, different countries. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have seen some of them working together, haven't we? Like Tripomi and GHG Sat have sort of been, yeah. you know, bouncing off each other, kind of thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think piggyback off of that and ask you another question, Jen. I feel like these aerial flights showing this very nice purple plume are a really nice visual way to connect. Here's an issue uh -huh. at a point source with a possible mitigation solution, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, where is that now? I mean, where is mitigation? Are there other tools that are so clearly lending themselves to solutions? I mean, on the, the beyond the plume scale itself? Yeah, or? it's sort of two parts. One is where's the mitigation, you know, at, at this point? And the other is, yeah. are there other tools that are so, you know, A to B in this way? Yeah, well, to tackle the first, the second one's a little tough, but at least the first one. I mean, mm -hmm. part of the airborne campaigns we've done is identifying partners, and giving them the data as quick as possible. A very close partner of ours is the state of California where a lot of these flights started. And we've been sharing data with them really low latency since 2016. They've gone out to operators, not in a regulatory fashion, but in an information gathering fashion to mitigate it. We've done follow-up flights. Uh, I think we estimate, and they estimate, um, you know, probably a reduction of about um, a million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent based on the flights alone and getting that data um, by just following up with the operators. It's not trivial though. There's, you know, a good example and we we'll won't make it too long in like Colorado, for example, where we saw a big pipeline leak and we got the state of Colorado out there. We got some other guys out there. I mean, we flew it eight times. We saw the leak every single time they went out there with the camera and they said, we can't find it. And eventually like, Someone who was determined went out with a shovel and started digging around for a pipeline, and then he found it. Right, so it's not you know there still is a there still is a a gap there, but um, it's about identifying the right partners who can who can do the stuff. And so we prototyped that, and it's worked. But you know we still have a ways to go for that to work kind of across the across the scale. And then to your next point of are there any as close you know A to B? I mean it's a I don't have a great answer for that, but I mean, it's that's what's needed. So that's why the engagement is so crucial to all of this, because um, especially for folks like us who are more steeped in the science. Um, is there any way to mitigate methane from wetlands? Or any talk about doing that? I mean, for, for, for rice agriculture, there's lots of management techniques mm -hmm. that can be implemented to reduce uh, the amount of methane being produced uh, for, for rice. Uh, you know, Changing sort of like the drainage cycle, and I, I think there's different sort of uh, genotypes that, that that can be grown. But um, for, for wetlands, I, that, I, I think there there is some research taking place to to look at um, uh, sort of the, the the mitigation options. But um, I, I think most most of it, you you end up with these these trades where you start losing mm -hmm. the carbon that's stored that that Lola described, and and the CO two is a is a much longer sort of forcing on climate than the methane. And so um, I, I think it would be sort of a, a net sort of negative um, to, to think about doing wetland management to mitigate methane. And so just to follow on that, right, and what Lola mentioned earlier, right, a healthy wetland will be storing more carbon. And in the long run, right, that yeah. it it is a larger component. Yes, methane is, is definitely more potent. And that's where, you know, Ben is saying is that net negative. But if you keep a healthy wetland, it will store more carbon and that will help offset 
hopefully offset those methane emissions. And they have, when you look at even beyond the just the carbon, we still we still need the wetlands for all the other services they provide: the water filtration, the water storage, the biodiversity, the you know food, all these things. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind. That like. Yes, we're worried about the methane part portion, but what was provided so many other services that you know we do want to make sure that we maintain them. <laughs> Last call for a short question. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you to the panel. It's been great having you here. I'm going to direct you to Kate Ramsayer, the NASA PIO. If you'd like to follow up content, she'll help you out connecting with our speakers today. And you want to hang out we're going to be talking more about wetlands about wild rice and, and working with native peoples on their cultivation so that's in the room in 10 minutes thank you